All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all for, uh, for being here. As you probably noticed, I am not Brian Jones. Um, I'm actually Brody Butland. I figured it would be a little bit better if we started with something a little bit more pessimistic and then Brian Jones could lift us all up rather than me just throw cold water on what would be his uh, presentation. And plus, I didn't want to follow him anyway. That would not be a, uh, uh, that wouldn't be great. So, um, for those who don't know me, I am a uh, business law attorney out of Cleveland, Ohio with the law firm of Porter Wright, Morris & Arthur. It's an Ohio-based firm, but we handle clients all over the nation, including, I believe, six in this group. Um, and uh, so I specialize in business law, do a lot of contracts, products liability, unfair competition, and then I've also carved out this little subspecialty of fitness law uh, for all of you. So, what are we going to cover today? Well, first we're going to talk about waivers, and I, I did a little bit of this last year, but I'm also going to, but I have some case law updates from the last year and a half that I think are pretty important that we need to discuss. We're then going to go into North Carolina's Guideline A, which is a uh, dietetics guideline released in February of this year, and it not only clarifies North Carolina's dietetics laws, but also I think is some pretty revealing for a national consensus on how these types of laws are being interpreted. And then we're going to talk about deceptive trade practices and false advertising, which sounds, I'm sure, really enthralling. And, uh, um, you know, but I think it'll be interesting. So let's go to the waiver. Now first, the written waiver. And I'm not going to rehash everything I talked about last year because I think those who were here last year saw it was pretty formidable. But I am going to talk about, uh, ju just so we can understand these cases, the four requirements I went over last year for a written waiver. So requirement number one is that it has to be conspicuous. It can't be hidden within a wall of text. And this makes sense, because if somebody's going to waive a really important right, namely the ability to hold you accountable, it better be something they can fairly easily find. Second, the language f fairly covers the circumstances at issue. This requires consideration of who the waiver covers. Is it just the gym? Is it you? Is it employees? Is it independent contractors? Where it applies. Is it in the gym facility itself? Does it include the bathrooms, the locker rooms? Does it include the parking lot? Does it go beyond the parking lot? You know, do you take runs in the city? And does the, does the waiver cover that? And then what does it cover? What kind of activities? Third, waiver of one's own negligence has to be expressly stated. And this also makes sense from a public policy standpoint, because if we're going to immunize someone for uh, acting with reasonable care, we want to make really sure that it's explicitly said in there. Now, this doesn't necessarily require you to use the magic word negligence, but simply saying waiving all claims or waiving all rights is not sufficient. You actually have to have an express call out of something that sounds like negligence. I think you should just use the term negligence, but that's, that's just me. And then last, another public policy point, you can't waive intentional misconduct. And again, this makes sense. We don't want people kicking others while they're, uh, while they're training them or something like that. Not only is it bad for business, it's bad for society. So um, now last year I talked a little bit about the concept of willful blindness. The idea that if you intentionally take no effort to make your facility safe, it actually can cross over from ordinary negligence into intentional misconduct. And there's actually a case that we're going to talk about related to that this, uh, from, the pa from this past year. So first, let's talk about conspicuousness. And here I have two cases to share with you. One's out of the Washington Court of Appeals, the Deasis case, Deasis v. YMCA of Yakima. And that case said that a waiver was conspicuous because it used bold and capital letters, so it was very easy to spot within the context of the agreement. It was re it, the, it, the uh, agreement repeatedly included cautionary language throughout the thing, so you're waiving your rights. By the way, you're waiving your rights. By the way, in case you didn't notice, you're waiving your rights. Oh, and you understand you're waiving your rights. 
And then it also used all capital letters above the signature line saying, I agree to all these precepts, including the waiver. So, big sign. That's pretty conspicuous, right? By contrast, we have the Pennsylvania Superior Court decided this past year, the uh, Hinkle v. Pardo, where the waiver was held not to be conspicuous. Why? Well, number one, it was on the back of a membership agreement along with 12 other provisions that had nothing to do with waiving. It was not differentiated. There wasn't any bold text or capital letters or anything like that. It was literally buried within the wall of text. It was the same size font throughout, and you didn't actually have to sign on that page. So there's no signature requirement. So what do these, what do these two cases tell us? You know, what, are, what are the takeaways for you all? Well, the obvious one is don't bury your waiver. We don't have to be ashamed of the fact that you're asking people to waive things, so don't be ashamed. Just put it out there, let them see it. Emphasize the most salient parts of the waiver with some kind of different text. I prefer bold type, uh, but capital letters also work, underlines work, but something that actually catches their attention when you're telling them exactly what they're waiving. And then make sure a signature line appears on the waiver itself. So it's something they actually have to sign on the page. You don't necessarily have to make them initial every paragraph, although that's one way that some folks do it, and I think that's fine. I would actually recommend having the waiver be a separate document, not have it buried within a membership agreement, because then it's very clear that it's set aside, it's very clear what they're asking. So that would be my recommendation. Yes? Has anyone in the room ever had someone fail to sign up because of the waiver? Mm -hmm. uh, you're not running business off of the way, so don't skimp on that. And that's also an important point. Before they actually do anything in the gym, make sure they sign that waiver. Because you never know what's going to happen. They might have a free workout and they, uh, you know, and they herniate their di a disc or something like that. You've got to be careful about that stuff. So it's not one of those things. You can't put the genie back in the bottle on this one. So. Now, here's a kind of a goofy case out of the Northern District of Illinois, 2014. And just to give a little bit of background, in this case, the gym member had a heart attack while playing basketball. And to put it mildly, the gym did a really bad job of figuring out what to do afterwards. So the claims in particular were that they didn't use an AED device at all that they gave incorrect information to a 911 operator. He had a heart attack. They said it was an asthma attack. There was improper crowd control. An entire group of people were milling around him, which actually interfered with the first responders getting in. And apparently nobody was ever bothered on how, nobody was ever trained on how you respond to emergency situations. Now, the uh, gym member signed a waiver before he entered the gym that excluded liability for injuries arising from participation in supervised or unsupervised activities and programs, and also, separately, injuries resulting from the actions taken or decisions made regarding medical or survival procedures. So, how do you think the court came out on this with respect to these four different claims? Who thinks that it said the waiver covered all of those? Yeah, I think it does too. The court said no. It said the first three were covered, didn't use the AED advice, gave incorrect information to the 911 operator, improper crowd control. All of those were covered by injuries resulting from the actions taken or decisions made regarding medical or survival procedures. But when it came to failure to train how to respond to emergencies, the court said that that actually, that is not covered by this language because it occurs prior to them setting foot in the gym. So as a result, they can state this claim. Now I, conf now I have to confess, I disagree with this decision a bit. I don't, I don't like the way it comes out, but it sort of goes to the old adage, what's the difference between God and a federal judge? 
God doesn't think he's a federal judge. So the takeaway from this, I think, is one, you can have a bad decision from a court. No matter how well your waiver is drafted, you can have a bad decision. This is the only case I know of in the country ever been decided that held somebody liable for failure to train for medical emergencies. I'm not aware of any other case in the nation where you had a waiver provision that seems to govern it and they still slice the bologna thinly anyway. But I think the takeaways we can have, aside from that sometimes you just have bad luck, is the fair coverage requirement is really important. Courts take it very seriously. And so as a general matter, you should make sure that your waiver actually covers the circumstances you expect it to cover, that you expect liability to be waived for. I would also say that if you own or control, have some control over gym space, or if you have employees, I would consider adding a specific provision that involves liability for emergency training, response training, and, uh, um, and, and actually having emergency responses just because of this case. I, I think now that this case is out there, now that it's in the public domain, it's probably something we should consider doing. And then last one, which is sort of a freebie, even though it wasn't really relevant to this case, know your state's AED laws. 12 states have some sort of requirement for fitness facilities to have AEDs in them. And then also requirements on how you, what, what you need to know. And, just for, and, and uh, just for your own edification, these states are Oregon, California, Nevada, Arkansas, Louisiana, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. If I said your state, you should probably look that up if you don't have an AED in your facility. And you, it probably would be good to know too what the training requirements are just for your own protection. Yeah, in, in a, and the question was in this case, was, did they not have sufficient training, like for example, a CPR, AED training, uh, th those types of courses that a lot of gyms require. Uh, and here, because the AED device use was covered under the waiver, the court never reached the question. So it, it never had to decide that. Um, so it's, I, I won't say it's an irrelevant consideration, but for the court's purposes, it said, since the waiver applied, we don't have to deal with that. That, by the way, is the benefit of a waiver. You don't have to deal with the merits of a case if the waiver, if the waiver covers the allegation. Now, there are two cases, oddly enough, both out of New York that illustrate another one of the points, that you have to, exp you have to expressly identify your own negligence for the waiver to be applicable. So in the case of Gallant v. Hilton Hotels, the waiver said, I assume and accept full responsibility for any and all injuries or damages that may occur to myself. What's missing? No express statement of negligence. Same thing with Kim v. Harry Hansen, Inc. The release said, all claims which I may have against the gym for all injuries which may occur in connection with my participation in a program were waived. Again, what's missing? Negligence. And in both cases, the court said the waiver did not cover negligent actions by the trainer because it's not expressly stated. The takeaway from these cases is pretty simple. Put negligence in the waiver or it's gonna be a problem. Now, I also told you about intentional conduct and that sometimes if you exercise so little care, your conduct can actually move from uh, ordinary negligence into the realm of willfulness and therefore can't be covered by the waiver. And that is this case out of California. Now, last year I cited a case from New Jersey that sort of talked about this principle, but this is the first case I know of where the court actually held that it had moved from ordinary negligence into the realm of willfulness. So in this case, a member was injured when the back panel of the cable crossover machine fell on her head. So I don't know if it was a loose screw or whatever it was, but it just fell off and hit her. The gym claimed that it performed, now the gym had a waiver and the waiver uh, included negligence, it clearly covered the situation at issue, no question that the terms of the waiver applied. The gym claimed that it performed monthly maintenance on the machine as required by the owner's manual. But here's the problem. All the maintenance logs for nearly two years prior to the accident were blank. 
Nobody wrote anything down. They may have done the maintenance, but they never, set, they never wrote anything down that they did it. And the monthly maintenance checklist from that particular month also was not filled out. The thing where it says all the things you're supposed to do on the machine when you check it, it was also blank. So what the court said is the waiver did not bar the claim because there was evidence that they exercised no care with respect to this uh, machine. And then the court said, a trier of facts could conclude from the record evidence that the gym failed to perform regular preventative maintenance and on that basis that it failed to exercise scant care or, dem or demonstrative passivity and indifference toward results. That's a really roundabout way of saying um, there's evidence that they just didn't give a damn, right? And the point is we have to. So what's the takeaway from Chavez? Well, the obvious one is maintain your equipment, right? You can't just do nothing. If you have a machine in your gym, try to follow the maintenance schedule. And also importantly, document it. Because if you can't prove it, it didn't happen or a jury may find that it didn't happen, and then that waiver that you spent all this time looking at after diligent notes from my presentation will not be worth the paper it's printed on. So, now let's move into dietetics. Now I told you about North Carolina's Guideline A, and that's gonna be the subject of this. Guideline A was revised. It actually is an older document. It's been around since the 1990s, but it was revised in February of this year after a lawsuit by Steve Cooksey. Now, I know that some of you probably recognize that name. He was the, guy, he was the diabetes lawyer out of North Carolina, and we're going to discuss that case a little bit to sort of explain what Guideline A actually means. But before we get to that, I'm going to give a very quick overview of stuff I covered last year for dietetics. Um, as I said last year, dietetics laws fall into three general categories. So the first category is there's no regulation on dietetics whatsoever. You can give whatever nutrition advice you want to a trainee. You don't have to have a license. You're not going to be legally liable. That's a very small minority of states. There are only three of those. The, far, the biggest category is what I called category two. That you, in order to hold yourself out as a dietitian or a nutritionist, you have to have a dietetics license from the state, but you're allowed to give dietetics inf or nutrition information without having a license. So in other words, you just can't use the title unless you've actually been licensed to use that title. Category three is the one we're concerned about as train, or uh, that we're, yeah, that's the one we're concerned about as coaches and gym owners. Category three does not allow you to give nutrition information as defined by those statutes unless you have a dietetics license. If you don't, you're criminally liable and, prob and civilly liable too, possibly. Yep. Uh, 20, well, I'm glad you asked because I also included the chart I did last year. <laughs> Three category threes, 25 category twos, and 22 category threes. By the way, this same chart is in the article that I had, um, that I did as well, although uh, the article I wrote last uh, April, I actually had Maryland as a category three. I now believe it's a category, uh, or I'm sorry, I had as a, uh, where is Maryland? Three? Maybe it wasn't Maryland. One of them I changed, and I forget which one it was. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and, and this chart also appears in the presentation I did last year, which is online, so you don't have to scribble down all the states. I mean, it'll be, and this will be online too. So now that we have that background, let's actually, start, let's actually talk about the Steve Cooksey case. Now, Steve Cooksey was a diabetic who ignored his nutritionist advice to do a low-fat, high-carb diet, which, you know, of course, you would want to do that if you have blood sugar problems, and he decided instead to do a paleo diet. Well, he had remarkable success. He lost 70 pounds, his blood sugar normalized, and he actually went off his insulin medication. And he was so happy with his results that he decided that he would start a website, diabeteswarrior.net. 
where he would, incur, he would tell people about his story, he would answer questions about what he did, he would offer meal plans that he used that were helpful for him. The North Carolina Board of Dietetics got mad at this. They're a Category 3 state. And in particular, they were mad at three components of it. Number one is what was referred to as the Dear Abby advice column. What Steve Cooks he would do is people would write into him with questions. He would pick a particular question he thought was illuminating, post it on the board, and then give a response on the public internet forum to the question. So just like if any of you have read the Dear Abby column, which is basically uh, you know, Dr. Ab uh, Dr. Abigail's, you know, she basically offers psychological advice to people based on their issues. That's sort of what this was. Second is he offered a forum for others to post questions and share stories. And periodically, he would uh, post in it. By the way, these two sound awfully familiar to a forum we have. I'm just gonna leave that hanging. And then the last one is he offered a diabetes life coaching service. People would pay him money and he would help them with meal plans, he would help them with, uh, with exercise habits and eating in order to help treat their diabetes. Now, he had been, Steve Cooksey decided to bring a lawsuit. He shut down parts of his website, North Carolina Board of Dietetics still hounded him, so he just brought a lawsuit and said, my First Amendment rights are being violated. In October of last year, the case was voluntarily dismissed. That is to say, they reached a settlement. And as part of that settlement, North Carolina, North Carolina released what was called Guideline A. Guideline A has two important components to it. Number one is that the dietetic statute only applies if there is a professional client relationship. This was a clarification they made. Now, Guideline A, offers 11 non-exclusive factors to determine if there is a professional client relationship. I am not gonna go over all 11 here and I'm not gonna put them all in 10 point type on here. I am gonna tell you, here are the highlights and these are the ones that actually make sense intuitively. Whether the person holds themselves out as an expert and whether they disclaim credentials as a nutritionist. Well, that makes sense. If you say, look, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm just sharing my experience, it doesn't look like a professional client relationship. Whether the person charges or receives a fee, if you, re if you charge money for this service, it looks a lot more like a professional client relationship. Which party sought out the relationship? If somebody comes to you and asks you a question and you answer back, that's a little bit different than if you advertise services and then they come to you afterwards. Whether the information is given to someone with a specific disease or if it's a, just a generally healthy person. If they're healthy, it looks a lot like a professional client relationship. If you're trying to treat a particular disease, it looks more like there's a professional client relationship. In this case, diabetes. Um, and then the circumstances surrounding the interaction. Is this in the case of, a, for example, a public internet forum? Is this a seminar? Or is this a one-on-one -on -one meeting in a special office you have? You look at the circumstances of the interaction, and if it looks like a professional client relationship, they may find it is. The next thing they said was that general non-medical nutrition information does not require a dietetics license. Now last year I talked a little bit about the general non-medical nutrition information. And, um, you know, there are various documents out there. I cited a Maryland Attorney General opinion, talked about that. I talked about Ohio's uh, Bulletin 8 and Guideline F, which are fairly helpful. And then some other statutes actually define it. Montana and Nevada actually define what general nutrition information is. It's still a little vague, still a little wishy-washy, but it gives us a little more guidance. Now, I'm not gonna go back and cover all of those, but I am gonna cover what general nutrition information is under guideline A. Now, I know this is a wall of text, so I'm gonna go through it, but I'm just putting it up there to show that there's actually quite a lot of exceptions. Number one, demonstrating how to cook good food. You don't need a dietetics license to teach somebody how to cook. 
sharing information regarding personal experience with dietary and nutritional choices. Well, sure, if you're just sharing your personal experience and saying this is what worked for me, you're not really giving dietetics information, you're just saying this works for me, or I know some guy or girl that this worked for. Information addressing recommended amounts of essential nutrients. That's actually the wording of the, in, that's actually the wording in the, in the guideline. Um, I think what this means is you can say, well, you should have a certain number of carbs or you should have a certain number of protein if you want to recover from your workouts. Information on healthy eating and healthy snacks. Maybe instead of having a Coke, you should consider an apple. Discussing carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, and water as essential nutrients needed by the body. So again, that's a direct quote. So these are all important nutrients and here's why they're important. Providing statistical scientific information regarding the correlation between chronic disease and the excesses or deficiencies of certain nutrients. You're allowed to tell people that when you don't have certain vitamins or certain minerals or certain, certain nutrients, that these particular diseases are correlated with this and vice versa. You're allowed to provide public and publicly available information. You're allowed to give lectures. And then providing non-fraudulent information about nutrients in food or supplements. This is what I call the GNC exception. Basically, if you go, basically GNC people can give information about their supplements as long as it's not fraudulent and they fall, uh, and they fall outside of that. Um, you may notice that a lot of these are similar to things I talked about last year out of Ohio's uh, guideline F and Bulletin 8, and that's because they are. Guideline A out of North Carolina actually very closely tracks Ohio's Bulletin 8 and Guideline F. In fact, they, there are a lot of direct quotes that seem to be more or less cut and pasted into it. So what this means is North Carolina's dietetic statute is actually somewhat in line with the rest of the nations in terms of their licensure, and I think that's a good thing.